In today's video, we're going to answer the question why we need to calibrate a vector network analyzer or a VNA, you know, and what does that calibration do, and how do we do it? So here are the major reasons why we need to calibrate a VNA. Number one is a VNA can give us a very large measurement dynamic range, you know, 60, 80, 100 dB or more. So any minor variations in frequency response of the circuits inside the VNA and the interconnects and things like that can all affect the ability to achieve that dynamic range. So we need to correct for those things. Also, we need to correct for phase response as well as frequency response, especially since we want to measure complex reflection coefficient and complex impedance. We need to really uh, zero out any errors in nonlinearity of the phase response of the instrument and interconnect. Another very important reason is to establish what we call a measurement plane or calibration plane. Uh, many times you can't connect your device under test directly to the terminals of the VNA. You've got to connect it with some coax. And the effect of that coax is it's going to change the impedance that's seen by the VNA. So you might say, why doesn't a factory calibration do what you need? Well, it really can't. Uh, the, a fact, the factory's got no knowledge of the interconnect you're going to put between the VNA and your DUT, so it, it can't establish a measurement plane at your DUT, and it doesn't really have any other knowledge of that interconnect, so it won't be able to correct for the frequency response or phase response of that. Also, there's a limited number of points uh, that a factory calibration can do. So it, it, those points may not line up and most likely will not line up with the measurement points you're going to make for your DUT. Mm -hmm. Thus we must perform a user calibration whenever we change the device under test, the frequency range, the interconnects, or anything like that. We really need to perform another user calibration. And this is just normal course of business with using a VNA. So what does a user calibration actually do? Well, again, the first thing is it corrects for what are called systematic error sources. And these are things like what are called tracking errors. And this is a reflection and transmission frequency response. So on the VNA, remember with it, we've got a source that we're sampling internally, sending through a directional coupler to the device under test that's measuring the reflection coming back. And then we've got a receiver down below that's measuring the through response. So the frequency response of uh, each of these power detectors uh, and the coupler and things like that all have to be corrected for. And those are all part of what is called the tracking and frequency response errors. Now the next class of errors to correct for are mismatch errors or matching errors called the uh, source match and load match. And that has to do with the impedance matching at the, at the ports of the VNA that will cause reflected energy to then bounce back towards the DUT and vice versa. So we need to correct for those as well. Now a third class of errors we need to correct for are leakage errors. And these are unintended RF paths. And for example, they may be related to the directivity of the directional coupler. Now ideally the directional coupler is only going to couple energy coming in the reverse direction, but there will be some leakage in the forward direction. And of course we want to eliminate the effect of that leakage path going to the port one receiver. Another is crosstalk. Crosstalk is coupling between the two ports of the VNA, which is essentially a path for RF to go around and bypass the DUT. And of course we want to be able to correct for and remove that so we can only measure what's going on in the DUT. Now the other important job of the user calibration is to establish the measurement plane or calibration plane so that when we're measuring a DUT we're measuring the terminal properties of the DUT and not being transformed by the interconnect to the DUT. So we do the calibration right at these DUT ports or as close as possible. And this removes the frequency response and delay or phase shift of the cables and ensures that the impedance measurements are not being transformed by those interconnect cables. Now the importance or the effect of that measurement plane can be shown very easily here with just using a Smith chart. So here I've got the Nano VNA powered up using the default uh, calibration and I've got nothing connected to the input and we can see that our measurement point over this 50 kilohertz to 900 megahertz frequency range is way out over here which indicates that's a pure open circuit even over this 900 megahertz frequency range. Now if we connect a short circuit to port to channel 0 here and take a look at the Smith chart we can see that uh, for this whole 900 megahertz frequency range we're sitting right there at the short circuit position on the VNA. Let's take a look at what happens if we connect just a short piece of uh, coax that's about 15 centimeters long. So right now I've got the port is open, so we're seeing an open there on the Smith chart. But if we connect up this uh, short piece of coax that is open at the end, right? So the other end of this is, is open, doesn't have anything on it. 
we can actually see on the Smith chart we've actually got a circle inscribing the, the Smith chart. At the start frequency at 50 kilohertz, the length of this coax is you know virtually nothing, so we're still seeing essentially a uh, open circuit. But as we move up in frequency, we can see when we get up to oh about 315, 320 megahertz or so, this open piece of coax looks like a short circuit that's a quarter wavelength long at that uh, 300 some odd megahertz. And if we go another halfway around, that'll be about 600, 650 megahertz or so. It looks like an open again. But you can see just this length of coax changes the impedance of this open circuit as viewed by the VNA. So it's very important to establish a measurement plane at our DUT interface so we measure the true impedance of our device and not the impedance being transformed by the interconnect coax. So when and how do we run a user calibration? Well, when we want to run a user calibration, it's whenever we make a change in the frequency range that we're going to be measuring, a change in the connection to the DUT, maybe a different set of cables, a different set of adapters, or if we're changing the ports that are being used in the VNA. Any of these conditions, basically any time you set up for a new test, you want to run a user calibration. So let's take a look at how you perform a user calibration. You know, most VNAs will have a routine that's built into the user interface and will involve making a number of measurements. Uh, making measurements with a known open, a known short, a known load or match, a termination, and also do a through and isolation measurement. These first three, the open, short, and load, or open, short, and match, depending on who you talk to, are the standards that are used when measuring reflection parameters, such as the uh, reflection coefficient, or S11, uh, SWR, impedance measurements. These are the only ones you need to do if all you're doing are reflection measurements on a single port of the VNA. If you're going to be making through measurements, like on a filter or an amplifier or something like that, and use both ports of the VNA, then you have to add doing a through and isolation measurement to remove those uh, sources of error as well. So let's take a look at actually how you do it. I've just set up the VNA to take a look at uh, a sweep from 400 megahertz to 450 megahertz on a UHF antenna that I've got down here. And I've turned on three displays, the log magnitude of the reflection coefficient, or the S11. I'll have the Smith chart to show the complex impedance, and then also have an SWR plot. We can see from the calibration indicator here, the, the small letter C means that I have a calibration, but uh, the, the points that I'm using here are different than the calibration that's being used. So we really need to establish a new calibration. So we do that by going into the Cal menu and we do a reset to clear out the current calibration and then uh, hit calibrate and we can see we've got our open short load and then isolation and through we're only doing SWR measurements so we're not going to do these latter two we're only going to do our open short and load we start by connecting the open to the port you might say well why don't you just leave the port open well the reality is is that you want each of these to have exactly the same reference plane or measurement plane so there is a, an open because it, it kind of extends the length of the shield and things like that so at lower frequencies it doesn't matter at higher frequencies it does matter so it's a good practice to get into so once I've connected the open I just touch on open and it makes a measurement on that you see that's now reverse text We're ready to do the short okay so we remove the open and attach the short and then touch short now, once the short is done, we're ready to do the load. So we remove the short and attach our 50 ohm match for the 50 ohm load and touch load. So now we've measured all three standards that we're going to need just to do our SWR measurement and reflection measurement on our antenna. So we can hit done and then we'll hit save. I'm going to save this to location 2. If we return to the calibration menu, we can see that the correction uh, text is highlighted, a reverse text that tells us that we're actually applying the corrections that we made. And you could always check to see the effect of the corrections by touching that again and the reflections are turned off. And then now the corrections are put back on again. So now we're ready to do our measurement on our antenna. A UHF antenna is now hooked up and we can actually see the reflection coefficient, or S11 plot uh, of the antenna. And we can see our SWR plot of the antenna and the complex impedance shown on the Smith chart. I hope you enjoyed this quick look at why we have to calibrate a VNA, what it's actually correcting for, and actually how you implement the calibration. If you like this video, give me a thumbs up. 
If you haven't subscribed already, please do so, and stay tuned for some future videos on this Nano VNA. It's a pretty cool tool for about 60 bucks. So thanks again, and we'll see you next time.